Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us, help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for episode 116. I'm going to take a break today from Palestine and Israel, although it may come up in our discussion. Not that there's anything really more important than being on the brink of world war in one of the oldest and most contested places in the, in the world. Um, obviously, the implications of the, the conflict breaking out there and, and between Palestine and Israel have, have global ramifications. We all understand that, and I would caution all American citizens and all free people everywhere to become much more um, conscious, much more aware, much more focused on global politics uh, in my senatorial race or in my congressional race. One of our themes to the constituents was the global affects the local and um, never more true than today. In a hyper-globalized society, in a hyper-globalized economy for American citizens, surely the global has ramifications on the local. And when you talk about full-blown kinetic warfare, maybe between nuclear superpowers or nuclear power nations, you certainly have uh, the, the circumstance for global geopolitical uh, occurrences, problems, conflicts to affect you locally, wherever you may be. But today's episode is about something else, and it, it, I, I got to thinking after talking to Professor Penn yesterday, uh, one of the first Hebrews, officially titled Hebrews podcast. We're not going to usually do Hebrews at at the big table. Actually, the big table that you see out there where I do my guest interviews is going to be home to a podcast called The White House, where we talk uh, stri- strictly or mainly uh, policy. And it'll be a sort of a round table where we talk policy with up to four guests, five guests with people on Skype as well. So it's going to be kind of a, uh, a round table rapid fire madhouse type of type of podcast in the future. So that that'll be coming too. And we're going to do that on Sunday nights or that'll premiere on Sunday nights. So hopefully when all of the all is said and done, you'll have, please call me crazy Monday, Wednesday, Friday with a few extra episodes sprinkled in between. Um, you'll have professor Penn Tuesday, Thursdays, you'll have heroes probably on Friday. We'll probably put in a, our heroes episode on Friday to accompany. Please, please call me crazy. And then on Saturday, you'll have the Royce White Show. In fact, we may do Hebrews on Saturday, uh, early Saturday morning or, or Saturday afternoon, and then the Royce White Show Saturday night, and then the White House Sunday night. Now, some would say, well, why are you doing so many different podcasts? Number one, we want to diversify the footprint so that we can't be taken down all at once, and we would hope that our loyal listeners and fans and subscribers would take the time out to follow each and every podcast, each and every property, and subscribe and like and, and at least interact with with those platforms or that that channel as well um, just to help the algorithm and, and in our case fight the algorithm um, but we want to diversify our footprint so we can't be taken down all at once I can't tell you how frustrated I was with YouTube back when when the great Steve Bannon was was taken down from YouTube and had had war room taken down from from his uh, war room YouTube channel taken down um that being said, special thank you to the entire War Room Posse, Maureen Bannon, Grace Chong, the great Steve Bannon, and all the War Room Posse out there in the audience. Um, we appreciate being able to uh, premiere or stream on War Room's Gitter page live every episode and also now their Rumble page, which we're still doing great in, in numbers over on Rumble, probably around seventy five to 80,000 uh, views per episode. So. We appreciate the War Room audience. We appreciate the MAGA, Ultra MAGA, America First constituents all around the country and all around the world because obviously the War Room, um, the War Room conversation has impact all around the world and, and the great Steve Bannon and his leadership, his political leadership, thought leadership has had influence all around the world, positive. Uh, maybe society, republic-saving leadership. 
So, or impact. Um, so when all is said and done, hopefully you'll have those podcasts and that'll, that'll kind of be the schedule. Um, uh, if you haven't already, please go and subscribe to Professor Penn's podcast. He was on last night. If you didn't get a chance, go check out that episode. Um, he's incredible. I mean, I just, I listen back to the podcast so I can timestamp and clip for our producers, uh, so I can timestamp and clip for shorts and, and other content use. So, you know, I, I often listen back to the podcast and I, and I just got to say, in all honesty, if you're not subscribed to the Professor Penn podcast, if you're not listening to the Professor Penn podcast, if you have yet to listen to a Professor Penn podcast, please go and listen to the episode from last night uh, and, and, and become familiar with him. He's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and he's just an overall good guy. I saw one of the comments in the in the uh, in one of the comments was Professor Penn's invited to the cookout. That's something we we say in the black community, whether or not people are cool enough or 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 um, I don't want to say cool enough, but but uh, good enough people um, to be to be invited to the cookout. So go and subscribe to the Professor Penn podcast. We had a great conversation last night here on Please Call Me Crazy, and it was a Hebrews podcast, but Hebrews will not be filmed at that spot in the studio, so look for a change in, in aesthetic for the Hebrews podcast. And it, was, it will also not premiere on Please Call Me Crazy's YouTube channel. Hebrews will have its own YouTube channel, and, and we'll let you know when that's up and live so you can go and subscribe and support. Um, no other housekeeping. Today I want to talk about Jada Pinkett. Uh, I want to talk about Jada Pinkett, but I also want to use Jada Pinkett and Will's situation to highlight what I think is more important. And and, and in that way, I'm really not talking about Jada Pinkett because what is there to say? I mean, Jada Pinkett's ridiculous. She's been ridiculous. Will Smith and, and, and their relationship or in his relationship with her has become increasingly ridiculous and we know how easy it is for man to be led astray by woman and vice versa. I always say the crisis of femininity is a is a failure of masculinity. Uh, but the failure of masculinity is not without without bearing from from the crisis of femininity. The two play uh into one another. They 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 affect one another. Obviously our biblical stories our, our creation myth uh would would shed light on that dynamic. So the two, the two of them are ridiculous. I mean, Jada Pinkett, what can you even say? I mean, it's, it's really not about Jada Pinkett, but what I, what I've been thinking about over the last couple of days, and it really dawned on me after talking to professor Penn yesterday, where in our Hebrews conversations, we often talk about the culture of, of Jewish, the Jewish identity and and the black identity here in America, which have become very, prominent cultural identities, uh, especially when it comes to the narrative. Professor Penn brought up how I was lambasted by the Star Tribune or, or um, I, was, uh, I was called anti-Semitic for saying that Israel is the linchpin of, of globalism. And I, I appreciated that, that pr 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 Professor, Penn, Professor Penn reminded me of the, the Star Tribune doing that in this time right now where Israel is in conflict and at war and, and the, the castigation of anti-Semitism is, is sure to come up, is already started to come up once again and, and will continue to in the, in the near future uh, in perpetuity per the, per the narrative of the mainstream establishment. They always use anti-Semitism. Um, but I appreciate him bringing it up in, in, in a more local sense with the Star Tribune from my congressional race uh, because it offered me the chance to be able to clarify what I meant. And, and what I meant is, is relevant, uh, correlates to what I want to talk about today. And when I said that the, the state of Israel or Israel is the linchpin of globalism and that the, the Jewish identity has become one of the cornerstones of the globalist narrative, it's not an indictment of Jewish, Jewish people or, or the Jews. Uh, no more insofar as Jews or people who identify as Jew, uh, Jewish have allowed themselves to, be, to, to have their cultural identity co-opted and used by institutions that preside over them. 
And I'm equal. I'm, 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 uh, I am. I am. I am equal opportunity in my criticism around cultural dynamics such as that. And today, in talking about Jada Pinkett and Will Smith, we come down to the black bourgeoisie. I mentioned it last night, but I want to mention it again today. I really want to talk about it today at length, and, and this is really the, the, the topic of the, the podcast, is the black bourgeoisie and the grandstand of the black bourgeoisie. I wrote a, uh, an open letter to LeBron James back in 2020. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. It's, it's entitled Epistle to the King. And uh, there's a chapter in there. Chapter five is black Jews. And in this chapter, I talk about, you know, I don't talk about Hebrew Israelites or, or blacks being the original Jews or anything like that. We can, well, I'll probably talk about that some in this podcast. But um, what, I, what I laid out is this, this narrative that was born out of the World War II, the post-World War II democratic liberal order, uh, and what, which is effectively the new world order that so many global leaders reference today in casual conversation. Yet the Star Tribune and many of the other mainstream newspaper publications or television channels and television networks will say that new world order is, is a conspiracy theory. Yet they say new world order right out in the open. I mean, talk about an insult to your intelligence. But anyway, the post-World War II democratic liberal order was the, the political, the political, uh, the prevailing political ideology that came after World War II that, that really was based upon um, the, the tragedy that happened to the Jewish people, uh, the Holocaust, World War II in and of itself, war, conquestual wars, um, and, and trying to kind of create a, an agency or an international community of peace that, that brokers, well, that, that oversees conflict, war, to try and place a ceiling on it, uh, some type of reasonable ceiling or constraint on war between nations, but, but effectively became a broker of war. And that's what the United Nations has become. If you want to go back and reference a great speech to, to reference this is uh, JFK or but more recently, Muammar Gaddafi uh, at the United Nations, his, United, his 2009 United Nations speech, which you can find on YouTube and, and watch in, in full length with, transla with translation. You can also find it on Please Call Me Crazy because we've run it twice now for this very reason. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, pro it's, it's, it's not a coincidence what, what we're seeing all around the world. It's not a coincidence what we've been seeing for some time. We are living under the governance. We are living under uh, presiding institutions uh, that, that govern over us that are highly organized. They are very educated. They are very, uh, they are very well-funded. Uh, and they have an air of superiority and arrogance about them that make them dangerous to say the very least. And that's the United Nations. But the, the, whole, the whole narrative was we can never let what happened in World War II happen again. Can't let it happen. Can't let a Hitler rise up. Can't let a, a, a fascist, nationalist, racial superiority regime rise to power and bring in other nations and, and cause all this chaos or, or wreak all this havoc. And in many ways, yeah, another Adolf Hitler didn't, didn't necessarily crop up over the, over the last 70 years. But surely that international community of peace has adopted much of the much of the um, anti-human, anti-God, anti anti-Jewish, uh, uh, but but also anti-Abraham, anti anti nature. It's become very anti. Let's just say that. This entire international peacekeeping community is led by um, is led by ideologues who have a, a very anti-human, anti-life, anti-God philosophy, uh, worldview, and so it manifests itself into many of the same things that that Hitler uh, has has rightfully been accused of of. Uh, being maniacal or or evil, and and part of it is because people don't realize that these intellectual or ideological traditions come from the same place. They came from the same place 
when Adolf Hitler tried to institute them that they come from now. And that's why the great Professor Penn has has done a, a huge service and justice as somebody who was formerly educated in in, uh, in in the university to to do the historical research for his podcast listeners uh, that has helped inform uh, our side of the movement. Other people like Alex Jones as well have talked about the history of the crown, the history of the British Empire. The sun never sets on the British Empire. All of you should should feel um, uh, encouraged to to go research the British Empire and the intellectual tradition that came out of the British Empire. Uh, and, and a lot of it is still with us today. One of which being Darwinism, which then became social Darwinism, which then became eugenics, which then became Nazism, but it also became liberalism or, or uh, you know, technocracy in the modern, in the modern day uh, sort of manifestation of it. And I know we're getting off track here, but I always have to go back and reference World War II and the, the narrative, the, the linchpin of globalism and, and people using anti-Semitism as a, as a weapon or as a cudgel to stifle conversation, especially in a time like today where obviously a great atrocity was done to the Jewish people there in Israel. And now Israel's at war, which means there will be a perpetual conflict where people's loyalty or allegiance, fealty to the Jewish people is called into question. And as a juxtaposition, if you are not loyal or uh, allegiant or, 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 have, or have fealty to the state of Israel or Jewish people, which can arbitrarily be determined at any time for saying anything about Jewish people at all, you'll be called anti-Semitic. Not by accident. Not by accident whatsoever. And it's not an indictment of the Jewish people. I want to be very clear about that. All of us, all around the world, no matter what little group we've been divided into, no matter what little corner of the, of the tent we feel we own and need to defend, all of those corners, for the most part, have been carefully crafted and co-opted by the establishment that wants to preside over you and really wants to run roughshod over you, wants to take away your rights, wants to take your idea of freedom, take away the idea of freedom, your freedom. And not only do they want to take away your freedom, but they want to crush the idea of freedom with, within you. Uh, and, and they also want to take away your citizenship because citizenship holds, the, holds those two together, your rights and your freedoms. And so the narrative of Jewish people after World War II would later become the narrative of black people after the Civil Rights Act. And there's a reason why the, 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 the Jewish lobby or the liberal-leaning Jewish political activism is so closely connected to and has such deep historical roots with the black civil rights political activism and, and, uh, and, and you know, freedom-fighting uh, alliances. And along the way, you know, you, you throw in the women's rights movement, now you throw in the LGBTQ movement, and, and you have a, a, a kind of four-legged, four-legged civil rights, human rights vehicle, four-wheel, let's say wheels, four-legged's a little too, little too throwback. I'm not riding horses anymore, although horse riding's a, a fun, a fun uh, activity. And people actually, people, the way we're going, people better, people better start thinking about riding horses again. I, I think I must, you know, start, start myself uh, cause who knows, who knows what's coming. I mean, the world's going to get crazy. I just throwing that out there. Everybody thinks we're going to flying cars is just as soon that, that we fall into an energy crisis and nobody's allowed to really drive any vehicles under the climate change initiative. And, and, uh, you'll be immobilized completely from any long distance travel. But nonetheless, black people have been the center of the political conversation, the political dialogue. And certain black people have been propped up within that political dialogue. And oftentimes they are the black people who, who share celebrity status from the entertainment world. Sure, you got political leaders. Sure, you got people who you know are, are, are community organizers or, or you know, 
all of that. But mainly we've created a culture here in America where, where you have uh, casual politics with French fries, fast food politics from our cultural elites, our celebrities, our influencers, our public figures. Of which black people or the black community or black celebrities, the black bourgeoisie and the black elite have become the cream of the crop. Jada Pinkett, Will Smith. And nothing makes me more upset than to see how so many people can be pulled into consuming the, the, the pseudo-intellectual bullshit from these black bourgeoisie celebrities. And it trickles. I mean, it's just a complete echo chamber. It's to the point now where I hope many of us in, in this audience, but many people who watch Fearless or, or if, you're, if you're jacked into the, to the, to the alternative media um, narrative that, that's now beginning to gain some momentum, you can, you, you, you can al- almost identify these fake, woke, black bourgeoisie sellouts just from hearing their first couple of sentences. And that goes to show you just how, you know, hive mind um, this, this, this idea of collectivist, collectivism or collectivist thinking can get. I mean, it has such a, such a hive mind quality to it that you, they, they start to sound alike. You know, that, like they literally start to, to have the same quality and tone to their voice when they're saying the stupid shit they say. It's weird. I mean, you, you, can, you can have whatever criticism you want of the far right or the populist or the nationalists or America First or MAGA or who you would call KKK or patriots or whatever you want to call us over here on this side of the, of the line. You can call us what you want, but one thing you can't say is that we have a hive mind. There's just as much uh, disagreement uh, on, on particular issues on the right side of the aisle uh, as there is between the right and the left. And that's what you're seeing right now in America. And it's a, it's, it's a compliment. It's a compliment of what they've deemed the right wing of the American political, political uh, culture. It's a compliment that we have discord and disagreement. I know my uniparty cuck sellout politicians in Washington, D.C., such as right now as we're trying to solidify a, a House speaker. I know they would try and make it seem as though the discord or the disagreement in the Republican Party is a symbol of chaos. It's an indictment of Republican politics or the, the conservative movement in America. But it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Right now, the right wing of the American political culture, the conservative movement, Republican politics, people who are within the Republican Party, activists, so on and so forth, we have all decided that there are certain fundamental questions that need to be asked and answered right now. And it's no longer advantageous for us to move forward, to, to, to just tumble forward or tumble downhill into this, this, uh, you know, this, this decline or into this, this, uh, this crisis, the number of crises that, that, that sit beneath us um, without asking these questions and trying to answer these questions. That's a healthy thing. So we do have dissent. We do have disagreement here on the right, the right wing, the right wing of the, the American political spectrum. But I wouldn't even call it right wing. You know, I would say that the populist movement, the genuine populist movement, is a movement in, in, in and of itself, in and of itself. It has a spectrum of its own. It's a spectrum that runs parallel to the mainstream con, uh, uh, conventional status quo American political, spec, uh, American political spectrum. This spectrum is running parallel to that spectrum. And yeah, you have an entire spectrum over here on the populist side, all the way from your Bernie Sanders to the, the RFKs, uh, you know, to the, to the Donald Trumps, out to the Alex Joneses, uh, right? So, you know, there, there's huge huge uh, misconceptions and misinformation that's been, that's been disseminated far and wide about the fundamental nature of our division here in America, especially when it comes to politics. 
and the black bourgeoisie are right at the center, right? Because what's the common, what's the common, uh, uh, what's the common criticism of of anybody who wants to talk about populism or nationalism or or this alternative media that that is questioning the mainstream narrative? They're commonly associated with two main, um, two main. Let's call them uh, name calling. Uh, uh, two two main castigations: conspiracy theory and racism. Now over here with racism, you got sexism, you got homophobia, you got transphobia, and if need be, when all else fails, anti-Semitism. Because hey, when you throw down the anti-Semitism, everybody gets a little weak in the stomach. And on the other end, you just got general conspiracy theory. But all of these over on this side, all of these isms, all of these, uh, you know, phobias, all of these identity politics uh, sort of uh, criticisms or, or uh, you know, castigations against people who speak against the mainstream narrative, all of them revolve around the, the, the baseline of racism. And it's been that way since, since segregation, since the Civil Rights Act. Black people, the history of black people, the, black, the identity of black people has, been, has be- become the lightning rod of globalism. Domestically. Nationally. Um, racism is the lightning rod of, of globalism. Internationally, Anti-Semitism is the lightning rod of globalism. And the two go hand in hand. I mean, one's no bigger than the other. And you got to understand that America's role, America's position, America's impact and influence on uh, international politics, on, on on world politics is so great that black people being used as a cultural lightning rod for globalism here in America is equal to anti-Semitism being used as a calling card for globalism all around the world. They, they, they're, they're what and what. And who's fostered, this, who's fostered this narrative? Who's helped build this narrative? Who's helped support this status quo, this dishonest, uh, d- disgraceful corrupt status quo? The Jada Pinkett Smiths of the world. All the black bourgeoisie sellouts who start to pontificate and, and, and give their platitudes about morals and ethics and, and, and you know, I, I don't even know. This sort of uh, pseudo-intellectual, pseudo-spiritual, uh, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism sort of blend of of Judeo-Christian, atheist, technocratic, science prevails ideology. I don't even know what it is. I know there's a lot of numerology. There's a lot of horoscopes. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, memes, the meme, the meme, the meme, uh, the meme philosophy of these people is, is deep and, and rich. Rich in that it's laughably rich, not not rich as in it's fruitful, but it's it's just a rich rich culture. Memes. These people are living by memes. You can see it. You can go on their Instagrams. You can go on their Twitter pages. You can go look at their stories on whatever whatever platform they're they're posting on, and you you will see these people living by memes. You know sayings, sayings from random people. I mean, they just find a meme and it's like. Yeah, let's repeat that. That that that's good. That sounds good, you know. Uh and it really waters down the 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 impact, the cultural impact of of words of of the English language, uh, of the construction of oratory and composition. I mean, we we are being bastardized. We are having we we have had our our intelligence bastardized. Uh, our our intellect and and our philosophical currency bankrupted by this global establishment, the same global elite that is proto-globalism, um, but now they're really doubling down. I mean, now, now part of the strategy, the fundamental strategy is we brainwash people, they're generally stupid, 
We can tell them whatever we want. They have no choice, but they're defenseless. I mean, they don't even have the intellectual or philosophical guardrails around their own critical thought, their own first principles, their own psyche to defend themselves against the brainwashing. So now you have a uh, what, what you would what you could call a a wild wild west. Who's going to come out as the best brainwasher? Right? There's a little interfight in there, right? Not has nothing to do with you. Has nothing to do with serving your interests. Has nothing to do with with your well being or prosperity. It all has to. It's this entire elite race is who's going to be the best to create the most docile uh, population of human beings. Politics, world politics for dummies. And the Jada Pinkett Smiths are a beta test. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I see online who affirm the dumb shit that Jada Pinkett says. And it's not just her. It's her as, a, as an example or a microcosm for American women writ large. It's not just Jada. I mean, Jada, Jada has a particular air of superiority and arrogance about the stupid shit that she says that makes it, you know, unique. It, it makes it a, a, a little tougher to stomach. It's a little bit more cringy, cringeworthy, for sure. It's the way she goes about it, the way she talks about it, the, the, the tone that she goes into, this sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like I, I'm really saying something, but I'm not saying shit. She's unique, but it's become many, many American women. I mean, there's an entire culture, culture uh, over on the liberal side of, of politics and, 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 you know, social, social media uh, that, that thinks, talks, and, and in many cases behaves in that manner. Many celebrities, many black celebrities, a lot of them black women, but the black men are following suit. And I'm starting to see the black men talk, talk like that as well. And you can hear it. I mean, you can actually hear it. Now, many people will say, well, you talk and you use a lot of big words and you try and sound smart. Look, there's nothing wrong with, with using big words. There's nothing wrong with taking, with, with taking your, your, uh, you know, your intellectual development seriously. There's nothing wrong with, with trying to focus on and, and foster uh, intelligence and, and even Furthermore, a, a philosophy, a philosophy to live by. In fact, I, I would encourage that. And, and, and I've, oft, I've often said on, on uh, many conservative media um, platforms, I give the left credit because at least the people who are involved uh, in, in this sort of fake woke political theater um, are trying to access some deeper level of thinking. It's just that the people they've been given to, to inspire, the people they've been given to lead that, that level of deeper thought are full of shit. I mean, they're all full of shit. They just are. I'm sorry to say it. These people are full of shit. Jada Pinkett's full of shit. Will Smith, he's full of shit. 90%, 95%, 98% of Hollywood is full of shit. 98% of black Hollywood is full of shit. 90%, 95, maybe higher. 98% of these athletes are full of shit. 98% of the black athletes are full of shit. Our celebrity culture is full of shit. They're full of it. Let me give you one prime example, one narrative. Because it's not really about Jada Pinkett. It's really about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. People go, well, how'd you make that jump? It's just kind of this thing in black culture where we, where we see a black man and a black woman who rise up to some successful position and we feel the, the, you know, the, the overwhelming need to celebrate them. When I was growing up in the 90s, there was no, there was no bigger Hollywood uh, uh, couple that you would look to as an example or a you know, goal uh, to, to, you know, to reach in your relationship than the power couple of Will and Jada, right? Will and Jada was a power couple. Um, you know, there were, there were other ones as well, but Will and Jada might have been the, the, the most commonly, uh, commonly referenced cultural power couple in the black community. Honestly, 
until Barack and Michelle. Um, Jay-Z and Beyonce. Okay, Jay-Z and Beyonce, they're right there. Probably maybe a little bit higher now over the course of the of their of their career. Uh certainly, certainly up there as well. And there are others sprinkled throughout. Don't don't get me wrong, but but you guys know what I mean. And if you if you're not familiar with the black culture, maybe you don't know what I mean. But I'll tell you that there was a lot of um there was a lot of uh referral to certain black couples that that had that were both people were popular or celebrity and had success had come together they got married or had kids or were in a relationship or whatever the case may be and and this was a symbol of what black couples should strive to be jaden pinkett jay-z beyonce but then it was barack and michelle and right now it's still barack and michelle and and in that way there's like this 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 common thread between our affectation, our acceptance of the bullshit that comes out of Will and Jada's mouth and the bullshit that comes out of Barack and Michelle's mouth. And for the most part, it is bullshit. But, but is it really on them? Is it really their fault? I, then this is, you know, this is what I'm really here to talk about. It, it, Black America, you all out there have to understand something. You can call me an Uncle Tom. You can say that I'm hanging out with racists or whatever the fuck you want to say, it doesn't matter to me. I know that there's a crisis of critical thought and first principles. I know that there's a, a profound philosophical bankruptcy. I know that the word globalism is completely lost on you. I know that you have no clue for the most part that you're living under uh, a prevailing political ideology uh, and an intellectual tradition called the post-World War II democratic liberal order that was fostered, that was facilitated, that was built, and is carried out by Atlanticist political elites. I know it. I mean, I could, and it's not an indictment of you. I just want you to realize the, the, all these elites, all these celebrities, all these public figures, all these these intellectual thought leaders that have come before you where you get your politics from failed to tell you this. And you have to ask yourself in, in earnest, just look in the mirror and say, why was I lied to? Why wasn't I told? And then have the courage to, to co course correct, right? Oh, damn. Mainstream media got me. Big tech got me. They had me following a bunch of fucking weirdos. I don't know how, but they had me following a bunch of fucking weirdos. But now, now that I've encountered the real information, now that I've encountered the truth, I get to correct my course. And that's starting to happen. You're seeing black people all across the country wake up and go, Donald Trump, MAGA, better for us. Not because they love Donald Trump or personally feel that Donald Trump's the, the best candidate that we could possibly imagine or create. Not because they, they, uh, they, they have some weird self-hatred of their own blackness and need to associate or, or, or um, uh, a, a, um affiliate themselves with with powerful white men from the patriarchy none of that none of that they're just starting to reject the fundamental tenets of the opposition you can't cut your penis off and become a woman men can't get pregnant stop teaching my kids about lgbtqism before they know how to read and do math um you know it was just basic basic shit Stop telling us that we got to vaccinate our kids or else we're othered as some type of dangerous threat to our community and our family and then the school or whoever else. Uh, you know, stop telling us that we can't call into question the, the, the outcome of elections as though 2020 was the first time that election integrity was 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 on the table as, as a prominent uh, question from the American people. You know, just basic, basic shit, basic shit. Feminism, stop telling us that white women can criticize whoever they want or can, can uh, accuse whoever they want of rape or sexual assault or sexual misconduct. And, and all of us, including black men, such as historically, if you go back, Emmett Till, are supposed to sit by and believe all women no matter what. Basic shit. Basic shit is playing in the favor of Donald Trump and the nationalist populist movement and the conservative movement and the more right wing, quote unquote, of American political culture. And it's not Donald Trump. And you can tell that people are having a tough time letting go of that mainstream narrative when they, when they refer to the migration of black people or, more specifically, black men to the right side of the political spectrum. You can tell they're having a tough time giving up that, that, that mainstream uh, media industrial complex narrative because it ain't about Donald Trump.
when you see a black man say niggas for Trump, it ain't really about Donald Trump. When you saw the black man tell Joe Biden, if you guys try and force us to take a vaccine, you're going to have a big problem on your hands. That ain't about Donald Trump. It just so happens Donald Trump is affirmed in, in, in much of what he's done because it lines up with what these people naturally are rejecting. I mean, that, that bodes well in, in favor of Donald Trump as, you know, as to how we should view him. Certainly it does for me. I mean, over time, if you're proven correct, if you're on the right side of history, that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, you can't look at it any way else. But let me tell you, the, 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 here's the main example of this black bourgeoisie narrative. I hope I'm not talking too much. I like to go on ranch mainly so I can demonstrate how, how real critical thought works, how, how the, the stream of consciousness can, can connect many things and give you one kind of uh, a synthesized view uh, of, of, of the world, of, of what you're seeing. And not to be afraid to do that, but also not to be woke, fake woke, pseudo-intellectual in doing it. You know, there's a thing out there, there's a truth out there, there's a way that it is, there's what you're being shown, and then there's the way that it is. And, and you can speak to the way that it is, and you can speak to it with some conviction, you can speak to it with some enthusiasm, you can speak to it with some, with some passion, with some emotion, and, and not be full of shit. Black people in this country are going to help decide the fate of this country. If you, I don't care if you like it or not. For the black people out there who don't want to be involved in politics, who have this cynical, uh, sort of nihilist view of American politics and the system and, and their ability to, to, to have the, uh, the, the, the position they need to change the, the nation to, or to change the circumstance of, of our country, um, whether you like it or not, it's going to fall on you. My fellow white people out there, whether you like it or not, it's going to fall on black people. You're already seeing that now. And anybody else out there, it's going to fall on black people because you're the linchpin of the cultural narrative, the bullshit cultural narrative. You're the justification for $1.2 trillion social welfare programs every year. You're the justification for uh, gagging a presidential candidate, for instance. You're the, you're the, uh, you're the justification for uh, vaccine mandates or now putting uh, spike protein into food. Theoretically, right? You, you're the you're the justification for it all. You're the justification for the the entire climate initiative. Now we have climate equality. Who does climate control? Who does climate change uh, disproportionately affect? Is what they'll say. You're going to be the justification for it all. You're going to be the justification for the same government you call guilty. On a fundamental basis. The same government you call guilty, the same system you call guilty, you're going to be the justification and excuse to give that government, that, that system, unlimited authority, which is ultimately going to come right back down on you. And here's the number one bullshit narrative we tell ourselves. We don't have, we don't have any of the levers of power. Who controls the system? I want to go back and reference Larry Elder's interview. And if you guys didn't see his interview on The Breakfast Club, please, you can stop this podcast now, go watch that interview, and then come back and resume the podcast because it's, it's, it really is the example of, of, a, of a prevailing cultural narrative we tell ourselves that is at the heart of the bullshit. Who's in charge of the system? Who's in charge of the system? Who has the levers of power? Who's in control? Who's running the system? This was a line of questioning that Larry Elder faced on The Breakfast Club from a radical leftist bullshit artist, black woman. I mean, they find a black woman every time. Black women are getting used. I'm, I'm bringing Mama White on the show because I, I, I'm sick. And you know what? I'm going to make it a point over the next four to five months to bring real black women on the show who aren't going to let liberal white women tell them how to fucking live and think. Okay, real black women who think for themselves, who I may not always agree with on every issue, but at least we're going to roll some people in here who think for themselves, who aren't going to parrot the party line. Number one, because 
I don't need to, you know, I don't need to talk to you. If you're going to say the same thing the next person says by default, why do you think you're original? Number two, why do you think it's worth listening to you? I really don't have to listen to you because you're saying the same shit that he said. Remember that from Eight Mile. Eminem, you know, won a battle in one of the in one of the rounds. He's like, Didn't you listen to the last battle, Meathead? You're saying the same thing that he said. I'm 32 years old, so you know, I'm sorry for all my boomers out there who may not understand the Eight Mile reference. Hopefully, my younger audience will 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 appreciate that. Eight Mile was a cultural phenomenon as well. White guy, rapper, Detroit, Eminem, one of the best lyricists of all time in the hip hop culture. Uh, very, very anti-Donald Trump, very, very anti-Republican per the narrative. Uh, but at the same time, it's a great rapper. We give credit where it's due. Um, anyway, anyway, that was a great line. It made me think of it in real time. Didn't you listen to the last round, Meathead? You're saying the same thing that he said. Now, the problem with it is a lot of people out there hear the same thing over and over, and somehow you start to fucking believe it. Like, if it's said 10 times, people just start to believe it. Actually, this is a, a strategy of the mainstream media industrial complex. This is a strategy of political campaigns. This is a strategy of corporations and marketing. This, this, is a, this is a predation on the human psychology, the vulnerability of the human psychology. Which I often go back to reference my story with the NBA because I fought the corporatocracy on the grounds that I could see they had plans to exploit the vulnerability of the human psychology, mental health, and, and profit from it, benefit from it, consolidate power from it, maintain a corrupt status quo. And many of us don't even realize that it's being done to us. I mean, it, it is a genuine blind spot, vulnerability, uh, you know, crack in, in, in the armor of, of the human psychology and rationale. Uh, to, to be able to repeat something and, and it, all of a sudden it becomes true. Programming. Programming. Um, we've all been programmed. Many of us have been programmed. Many of us are waking up. Many of us are starting to take that red pill. One of my, one of my uh, aliases or handles in the conservative media world is, is Morpheus. Myself, I'm more so like the hatchet man. I'm the hatchet man of the America First movement. But Morpheus is great. Morpheus was a great character, and there was a lot of wisdom in that character in The Matrix. In fact, uh, aside, from, aside from it being a, a simulation, a computer simulation, um, The Matrix really demonstrated um, some of the, the psychological vulnerability or the psychological prejudgments or the, 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 the fundamental ability for, for human beings to be psychologically hijacked and brainwashed into believing a narrative just because of its repetitive, uh, just because of how much it's repeated. And so many of us are a victim to that, and, and, and you can see it, you can hear it. I, I know, I know. We're, this is the only way that we're going to be able to reach out to the other side. You can't argue with them. You, you, you can't argue the details. You can't argue the facts. You can't argue the, the fundamental uh, first principles. You can't argue the, the premise. You can't argue the, the, you know, the, the, the history. None of it works until you break through to people and actually get them to realize, number one, they have the capacity to be brainwashed. They, it, it, they have the potential to be brainwashed. They have the potential to be programmed and then get them to see where that programming had happened. You can't even talk about the rest of it until you do that, which is why I make it a point to go into conversations in depth with nuance and demonstrate how to think. It gives people permission to think, to have an internal dialogue that can help them deconstruct the programming and narrative that's been set upon them. If you need a leader, if you need a thought leader, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be that. You know, not an arrogant way, but just do you have the do you have the courage to think? Do you have the courage to take something that's been told to you and dissect it in three different ways and see if it still comes back rational, sane, logical, truthful, honest? In philosophy, this this practice, this this field of 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 uh, study is is called epistemology the acquisition of truth, how to discern, how to be able to, 
to, to measure or discern what is true and what is not true. Epistemology. And the number one problem in America right now, I mean, yeah, you could say it's division. You could, you know, you could say it's a lack of faith. You could say it's a lack of sacred honor and national honor, like myself and the, and the great Vivek Ramaswamy talked about, um, you know, in, in our interview recently that, that just aired a couple of days ago. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. Me and, me and Vivek had a good conversation. Hopefully I go back to Ohio out there and we can, we can finish, have a much longer conversation. He only does our podcast, but he and I should probably do about two, two and a half to really, to really get to the bottom of some things and, and further demonstrate how to critically think. Vivek, with all the criticism of him, one thing about him is that his mind is sharp. He's sharp and he's a, he's a very critical thinker and he's quick. He's, he's, he's um, quick on the, on the fly with analyzing a given topic that's being discussed and, and breaking it down to, to the fundamental problem, right? Which is what you want in, in our political leaders. And that's why if Vivek isn't successful in his presidential candidacy, if, he's not, if he doesn't become the, the, the president of the United States, people like him being involved in politics is a net positive, I think. And Vivek has a ways to go on some things. I have a ways to go on some things. RFK has a way to, ways to go on some things. Donald Trump has a ways to go on some things. But, but the, the community of people that are willing to think about things in, in base terms and what the fundamental problems are, are our only hope of getting out of this huge global mess we've created. I digress. Number one bullshit story from the black bourgeoisie. Number one bullshit story from the Jada Pinkett's and the Will Smith's. Number one bullshit story coming out of the, the, the black community. We don't own the system. We don't run the system. Larry Elder faced that on The Breakfast Club. The woman kept asking him, but who runs the system? But who runs the system? And she was trying to get him to say that white people run the system. And Larry wouldn't bite. He kind of just ignored it because it was such a absurd, obnoxious. It was such an absurd question, but even more importantly, it was such an obnoxious way to ask the question that he just decided not to engage it. But the real... The real counterpoint to make is it's a lie. And I said this last night, and when I was watching the podcast back, it made me think even deeper about, about this, this narrative. It's not true that black people don't run the system or that black people haven't had their hands on the levers of power. That's not true at all. That's a complete lie. There are plenty of black people who have made it as high as you can possibly go in the system, who have had their hands as high as you possibly could get on the levers of power. There are black people who have s sat in places as influential, as impactful as you could possibly hope for in our co country here in America, in our culture around the world. There are plenty of black people. There are plenty of people, plenty of people with dark skin, with brown skin, with black skin who have been in powerful positions. Most of them sold you out. Most of them are sellouts. That's the real issue. The real issue is that most of the black people, most of the black people that rise up in society sell us out. They sell us all out, but they sell out black people first and foremost. Is there a better example than Barack and Michelle Obama? And all of you people are still riding the train. You're still riding the bandwagon. I mean, you still look at Barack Obama and Michelle Obama as, as some goal of, 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 of being a power couple. I mean, yeah, you can be – and the whole argument just kind of – the whole argument debunks itself. That whole cultural norm debunks itself. If we've never been in positions of power, if we've never had our, our hands on the levers of power, then why do we celebrate people every time they reach a high level in the corrupt system? Another example, and, and you know, Barack Obama, again, is a great example. He was in office, and you had people who celebrated him being the first black president, 
And then the entire time he was in the office or, or in his time now after being in the office, everybody creates this excuse for him that he, he's not really the one in power. As though he had no choice in the matter. And then many people, if you want to expand the conversation beyond black people, many people make a similar argument about the president's office in general or the position of the president in general, that the president doesn't really run things. Which, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, is true. I'm not saying that there isn't power behind the, 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 the president or the president's office. In fact, I think there's a lot of agencies in, the, in an outgrown government that, that seek to undermine the power of the presidency. For sure, we've seen it firsthand. That exists. But for us in the black community, I mean, you can't say that the president has no power so you can excuse Barack Obama from his, for, for his lack of leadership. I mean, that's a racket. That's what it is. That's a cultural victimhood racket. The president doesn't have any power. None of these positions you could reach in society have any power that would legitimize the claim that black people, in fact, do have political power in America, or they have been in positions, uh, they have been in positions of political power in history, and they've squandered it. So the built-in excuse is, no matter who you are, when you reach a certain position, when you reach a certain level in American society, you still, get a, 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 you still get a pass for not being a true leader because you don't have that much power or juice. But at the same time, we want to celebrate all these people as though them reaching that position, them reaching that level, is a great accomplishment. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that the vice president doesn't have any power or, or the president doesn't have any power, but we all spend four years of a political cycle clapping like seals because Kamala Harris or Barack Obama get into an office. You see the racket that we, I mean, that's a racket we're running on ourselves. It really is. The black community's got to wake the fuck up. Stop bullshitting. You know, and that, you know, you, you can not like me if you want to. I'm not a bullshitter. First off, I don't give a fuck if you don't like me because I like me and I, I'm not, I'm not afflicted with this plague this epidemic of self-doubt and the need for this, you know, this kumbaya, this group thing. I don't give a fuck. I don't like you. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to know what you're doing. I don't want to know what you think. I don't give a fuck when your birthday is. I don't care about your zodiac, your horoscope. I don't give a fuck about the meme that you're reposting from some other person that you follow. I don't give a fuck what outfit you had on today. I just don't give a fuck. I, that's me, you know. I, I think the, the, the boomer crowd, I think they like me because I'm sort of like a grumpy old man myself. At 32, I'm kind of like a grumpy old man. I, I, can, I can honestly admit that. You know, I like to be to myself. I like the people I like. If I don't like you, I don't like you. I don't care that I don't like you. I don't care how you feel about me not liking you. That's just the reality. And if you follow these woke politics, respectfully, I'm willing to sit here and talk about it and try and explain why you should abandon that ship. But I have the pleasure of being able to do it through a camera, and I don't even actually have to interact and sit with you. Because if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. Because I'm, I'm of the type where I just tell you to fuck off just because, you know, full of shit. And I don't have time for it. I take my life serious. I take my time precious. Now, I understand that sitting here and taking the time to do this actually helps illustrate these problems for certain people. And then they feel empowered and they feel encouraged and they are given permission to, to take their, their thoughts, uh, the things that they, they may think in their own individual and personal lives, and then turn that into action. That's how political activism works. And I, and I think that's valuable. I think that's worthwhile. It's definitely worth my time. That's why I decided to get into politics and run for Congress, and now I'm running for Senate. Um, but for the most part, I mean, in general, I don't give a fuck what most of these people think. So you can call me a coon or Uncle Tom or whatever you want. It doesn't really matter to me. The truth is the truth. You can't say, you can't say that any black person that reaches a position as high as Barack Obama or Kamala Harris or Jean-Pierre or whoever else has no chance of, of, of actually affecting or impacting policy 
has no chance of, of, of influencing the system and then spend four years of the political cycle or two years of the political cycle or whatever amount of time celebrating these people making it into that position. Do you all notice that that's going on? I mean, just drop in the comments. If I'm lying, just say it below. Just tell me. Do you all notice that we celebrate people making it into a position as though the position is, I mean, when you celebrate, a, when you say, let's all celebrate Kamala Harris becoming the first black woman to be vice president, you are effectively legitimizing the role of vice president. Because if not, why would it matter if she became vice president? If the, if the, if the office of vice president, if, the, if, if being a vice president in this country doesn't really mean anything, why is it a celebratory moment? Same thing with Barack Obama, first black president, first black president. I can't tell you how many people I've seen, you know, whether it's Vlad TV or The Breakfast Club or whichever one of these hip hop cultural media outlets, you know, that's become the, the think tank for black culture in some strange twist of, of, of events. Barack Obama, we got to support Barack Obama because he was the first black president. To become the, the president of the United States is worth celebration. Why? Why is it worth celebration if the presidency doesn't mean anything, if the president doesn't have any ability to actually affect change? Why are we celebrating it? It's, it's, it's a reflection of our self-doubt. It's a reflection of our, of our self-loathing. It's a, it's a reflection of our, our, um, our, our lack of leadership, but, but also our lack of, of, of love, expectation for our own life, for our own life, for our leaders, for our citizenship. It's nihilism. That's what it is. It's nihilism dressed up by its nihilism dressed up by wokeism and and um you know the the casual company of of whatever other black person or whatever other work woke person you may run into where you could say where you could say this this casual thing that's in alignment with the overall worldview or the overall political worldview and and get some brownie points or or keep the conversation safe and comfortable this is a corrupt status quo. And it may seem benign to some people. It may seem like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's a big deal. The culture of small talk itself in America is kind of a, is kind of a scam. You know, small talk kind of conditions us to not want to have to, to, to deal with the, the tough conversations that require uncomfortable questions and even more uncomfortable answers. Everybody wants to get together and small talk. I'm almost at the point where I don't even want to small talk with people. And some, you know, people, people comment and, and, you know, online, social media, YouTube, whatever it is. And they say, you know, Royce, you seem like you're unapproachable. I've had people write me and say, I was in the same place as you. I saw you here. I saw you there. And I go, well, why didn't you come up and, uh, you know, introduce yourself? Well, you seem unapproachable. I kind of like that. I mean, I know I'm running for office and it's antithetical to what you would want from a politician that's supposed to be uh, polite, polished, and then becomes a puppet. Uh, you know, they, they're supposed to kiss babies and, and shake hands and whatnot. Um, but I like, I like that unapproachable quality. And I'm really not that unapproachable. I'm, I'm, I'm a nice guy. If you know me, anybody who knows me, I'm cool, laid back for the most part. You know, you meet me out in public, I barely talk. About, I don't talk about politics, you know. I, I, but, but more and more, as I'm starting to work through this in my own mind, I'm, I'm seeing how very subtle cultural norms have driven us to the place we're in now. And that's one of them, small talk. And I, and I see it in this context because, we, you know, 
Barack Obama becoming the first black president was this was this milestone, was this was this historical moment that everybody could come together on at the cookout and and celebrate. I mean, and when you take away God, when you take away the gratitude or celebration you should have every morning, you wake up, open your eyes, and can draw fucking breath. When you take that out of a society and culture, I guess a a a a, a, a populace, I guess a a a, a nation, a, a community, does start to feel this desperation to find reasons to celebrate, and we have no shortage of them. I mean, there's an infinite amount of holidays in this country. Infinite amount. Every month is a holiday. Every month is a holiday that that sequentially change you, chains you, not change, changes you, chains you to the next holiday. Right now, it's Halloween. Everybody's gearing up for Halloween, and then it's going to be Thanksgiving, and then it's going to be Christmas, and then it's the New Year's, and then it's St. Patrick's Day. And then in March, I forgot what's in March, and it's spring, right? Spring break. Oh, spring break, break's a big deal. And then it's Memorial Day, or it's Cinco de Mayo, or it's, uh, you know, it's, it's in, in June, it's, it's the, the, the first day of summer, summer break. I'm a parent, so the school, you know, the school calendar is, is uh, significant in, in, in our household and in my life. But then it's summer break, right? And then it's 4th of July. And, and, and then, you know, it's, it's going back to school. It's Labor Day weekend. And it all goes again. It's Halloween. It's Thanksgiving. It's Christmas. It's Black Friday. It's you know. It's just a constant, nonstop uh, effort to to find reasons to celebrate. And I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Although biblically speaking, you could, you know, we could have the argument or the discussion about Christmas itself and when the holiday is celebrated and when it's supposed to be celebrated or if it's supposed to be celebrated and the idols and the the Christmas tree, and we could talk about all of that. That's a whole nother podcast. In general, I think we should continue to celebrate Christmas. We need all the Christ, all the acknowledgement of Christ that we can possibly get. But all these other holidays are just, I mean, it's nonstop. It's nonstop. A, a, a country, a culture, a nation, communities that are deprived of the 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 gratitude to celebrate every time they wake up in the morning, every little small thing they've been afforded and given in this life, that, that genuine gratitude to God, a culture that's been deprived of that is going to be desperate to find reasons to celebrate. And it's not your national holidays that are on the calendar necessarily. I just pointed that out because it's, it's, a, it's a reality here in America. But it's the little cultural norms that we start to try and find uh, find reason to celebrate. Even if it means celebrating your own victimhood. Right? And in, in many ways, the black community has come together, has loosely come together all across the country in celebration, casual, casual agreement, uh, casual... Talk casual, casual thinking, hive mind about the the celebration of victimhood. And I'm not one of these pick yourself up by your bootstraps Republicans or conservatives. If there's one criticism I have of Larry Elder, although I think he's a very sharp guy and, and he's saying a lot of things that need to be said, the whole pick yourself up by your bootstraps implies that there isn't a deep, dangerous, pernicious, manipulative, predatory federal government or system that means to bastardize your citizenship. That means to bankrupt you. That means to take the, the, the very essence of, of freedom and rights and, and weaponize them. That means to own you. But it's not just black people, but black people aren't exempt. I mean, just because black people are at the center of the cultural narrative about identity politics doesn't mean they're not going to become the, the doesn't mean they weren't they, they were not precluded from becoming wage slaves and they will not be precluded from becoming slaves under a technocratic 1984 George Orwell type of scenario. 
slavery for everybody, ran it as a pilot on black people, ran a lot of these psychological uh, operations on, on black people as a pilot. And one of them is this basic and fundamental one. I hope you understand. I mean, I hope this isn't so nuanced that, that the importance of it is lost on people. I hope so. I hope that. But we have found, we have found community. We have found the sense of community, the, the small talk, the, the convenience of conserving a corrupt status quo in victimhood. And so when I say, for example, why are we celebrating Barack Obama becoming the first black president if the office of president doesn't mean anything or doesn't have the power to change anything? How can a man run on the idea of hope and change but get into office and not change a motherfucking thing and then we all continue to revere him for his milestone of making it into that office based on skin color alone. And th this is a common thing across, look, this is a common cultural norm and practice. That skin color alone is a basis. Skin color alone is a, is a, is a basis for community. And sure, you may share a community with people with a similar skin color. I mean, I would venture to say skin color itself is, is partly a scam. No, it's not partly a scam. It's a scam. There's only one race, the human race. Let's just cut the bullshit. There's one race, the human race. We live in a history. We live in a society that comes from a history where race was intentionally made a priority at a point in time. But historically speaking, as, as old as, as humanity is, it's very easy to group yourself with people who you can see a difference in on the surface. I'm tall. If I go into a room, I may go find another tall person. And the convenient common conversation may be, damn, we're the two biggest motherfuckers in here. It's different up here, ain't it? The air is different up here. You know, what's it like finding clothes? Right? You got to roll your sleeves down constantly like this sometimes when you get a cashmere sweater. Right? I'm joking, but shit like that. Right? I may find common, common conversation or common community with other tall people. If there's a school that's predominantly white and, and you know, I'm the black student, I'm one of the few black students, another black student comes into the school, you might say, hey, there's another black kid. Kind of looks like me. Kind of. Kind of. I mean, there's a lot of variety to the skin color of black people. Isn't there? Some people darker than others. Some people, you know, hair textures different. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, it's a cover story. It's a, it's a desire for us to group ourselves into our appearance. Darwinism, social Darwinism, that has led to the, the community, the community of victimhood. There's no community in victimhood. There's nothing in victimhood but death and slavery, oppression. An oppression that we're doing to ourselves. I can't tell you how many people, how many people comment and say, the Republican Party is just as bad as the Democrat Party because I'm running as a Republican. Nobody knows that more than me. Nobody knows that more than Steve Bannon. Nobody knows that more than Donald Trump. The people on this side of the movement, the people in this, in this substrate of the American political culture have been calling out the, the corruption of the two-party, which is really one-party system, for a long time. So we're in agreement with that. The Republican Party is just as bad as the Democrat Party. Mostly because many of them are working at the behest of the Democrat Party. One party, two, two outcome framework, two choice, fork in the road, one benefactor. And many people would agree with that. But our mentality, our nihilism says, 
run from the situation, reject the situation, disconnect from the situation. You can't run from the things that you want to change. You can only change them. That's the real essence of change. That's what Barack Obama should have did. That's what your leaders could do. Your leaders in black Hollywood, they want to complain about racism and so on and so forth. Why don't they do what the American founding fathers laid out in the Constitution for them to be able to do? Once we abolished slavery, once we got past segregation, once we got past the, the, the systemic racial barriers that previously existed at certain time in this country, why don't they do what, what, what's obvious for them to do? Why don't they start their own business? Why don't they start their own? Why is it? Why is it the complaint? Why is it the, the, the mentality of black people is to judge ourselves based on white people's acceptance of us? their love of us, their willingness to, to, I don't know, affirm us, uh, uh, praise us, whatever the case may be. I mean, for, for, for a culture that makes such a big deal out of oppression, out of, uh, 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 you know, out of uh, uh, oppression, uh, slavery, segregation, all of this, 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 dark and unfortunate history that black people have been through in this country, for everybody out there who does that, who, who finds that common community and that victimhood narrative, you sure do spend a lot of time, you know, worried about what white people think. Why are you so worried about what white people think? Why are you so worried? And I hate to even make it about race because, again, there's only one race, the human race. You know, my grandmother, who I'll have on the podcast one day, and we'll talk, we'll talk politics, but, you know, she, she, she looks whiter than most people I, you know, most white people I know. Her dad's half black. If you saw her, she she's, looks white. Mom was Norwegian, you know, first-generation immigrant from Norway. Dad was black, came from Arkansas, from a slave family. He, he wasn't a slave himself, but he came from a family that was, you know, by way of the slave trade, by way of slavery in the South. She doesn't look black at all, but she's black. I mean, how black do you have to be to be black? I mean, that's the, the next question. I mean, when you start to break down the human identity into percentages like that, you, 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 are, um, you are walking a very fine line into becoming a, a, a radical sort of material, eugenic, scientific, uh, scientism-based based way of looking at humanity. Which, again, stems back to Darwinism, social Darwinism, and the, uh, the intellectual tradition from, from the British Empire or the Crown. Again, if white people have done you so bad, if colonialism has done you so bad, if the white man has walked around the earth and shed so much blood, why are you so obsessed with what he thinks about you? And even furthermore, why are you so obsessed with carrying, carrying on his ideological and philosophical, ide uh, his philosophical and ideological traditions? philosophical, intellectual, ideological, academic traditions. I don't even think you know you're doing it. I honestly don't even think you know you're doing it. Barack Obama's the perfect example. You all want to celebrate Barack Obama becoming the first black man to be president of the United States, then give him a pass, then make an excuse for why he didn't actually change shit by saying that the office doesn't mean anything. Well, then you can't celebrate it. It's no longer a celebration. And even furthermore, it should, it should worry you. It should really concern you. I mean, it should really concern you that the president of the United States doesn't have any power to change things in this country. If I'm a citizen, that would worry me. I mean, I think it kind of speaks to a, a certain scam in electoral politics if, 
if the commander in chief of the nation, the president of the United States, doesn't have the power to change anything. There's another sort of scam that's been run on, on the American people, right? But no, you don't take it that way. Your, your, your response isn't, whoa, caution, uh, alarm, uh, this, this is a problem. If in civil rights we fought for the right to vote, and that was a huge celebration, but, but the president that we now can vote for doesn't have any power, I think we're in the same spot we were in in 1968, right? I mean, per the, per the narrative. You tell me. Feel free, drop it in the comments. Maybe I'm way off course here. Maybe I'm way off track. Maybe I'm just, maybe I just came into the studio today and I didn't have anything better to talk about, so I'm just, you know, spitballing some, some bullshit. But for the life of me, it was on my mind all night. I couldn't sleep because it, it became so clear how much we celebrate the rise in society of black people as though that is the, 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 the sort of be-all, end-all, at least politically speaking, economically, socially. It's the be-all, end-all for people with black skin to be accepted or, or hired or, or elected into, into positions of power only to then let them get into those positions and make the excuse when they don't do shit with the opportunity. Self-loathing, self-doubt, masochism. The common community of victimhood. Because what it tells me is you just want to, you want to continue to be a victim because being a victim is convenient. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I'm not saying there's not an establishment out there that means to that means to harm you. That means to victimize you. I'm not I'm not saying that there's not an elite, a corporate elite, a political elite, a financial elite that's not out to to take you down, out to crush you. In fact, I would caution the the exact opposite. There is a political elite, there is an a financial elite, there is a there is a a, a a corporate elite that means to crush you that exists it surely does in fact all of the bourgeois celebrities that you spend so much time following work for that elite they do the bidding of that elite they carry the messages they carry the water of that elite and yet you still find the time in your busy life of being a victim to give those people, your focus, your, your energy, and most, most, most of all, your money. And even more scary, your fucking vote. Your time, your energy, your money, and at bottom of your American citizenship, your vote. This is my problem when I was out there during George Floyd. I mean, it was so providential that the George Floyd situation happened here in Minneapolis and I got to hear the dialogue, the political dialogue on the ground. It was providential for me. I needed that. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have, an, I, I, I wouldn't have the basis to talk about these things. I wouldn't have the basis to, to deal with this, with this current political culture and lead the way that I need to lead without having seen that and heard that. The whole system is guilty. That was the number one. That was the number one chant. The whole system is guilty as hell. But all of y'all are jacked into the system. All of y'all are paying for the system. All of y'all are buying from the system. All of y'all are voting for the system. What do you mean by the system? I mean, you know how goofy it makes black people look all around the world? When you say white man bad, when the highest formulation of your political concepts, your political constructs, your, 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 your political worldview is to, to identify that there is a system that often becomes predatory 
and then just lay the entire thing on white people in the most general way. And not specific, not, you know, no more detail than that. Just white people. You know how fucking stupid that makes us look? It, that makes us look stupid. It actually makes us look dumb. Honest to God, it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. But not only does it make us look dumb, not only is it ridiculous, or, 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 you know, not only is it ridiculous from an intellectual standpoint, it actually allows all of the people who claim to be doing you a favor, who claim to be working on your behalf, who are white or otherwise, to, to slide on under the radar when they fuck you. White liberal woman says she loves the black man, says she loves the black woman, says she loves black people, black lives matter. You let her slide under the radar. White man, he says he loves black people, donates money to the black philanthropic project, gives some money to the HBCU. You let him slide under the radar. White man says we should let the black woman lead or he hires Jean-Pierre or, 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 or selects Kamala Harris as his running mate or sings the praises of Barack and Michelle Obama, you let him slide under the radar. LGBTQ community holds up signs that say black trans lives matter. You let them slide under the radar. International peacekeeping organizations like the United Nations or the World Health Organization or the World Economic Forum say that equality Equality, diversity, and inclusion are at the heart of their initiative, are at the heart of their mission. You let all them slide under the radar. Political elites say if you get an ID to vote, if they, if they require IDs to vote, then black people aren't going to be able to, 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 to vote, that black people are left out, that black people are being discriminated against. You let them under the radar. The entire electoral apparatus you let them slide under the radar you see where i'm going here <laughs> adam silver and david stern say but not david stern he would have never let no black lives matter stuff fly and that's an indictment of him on the other side or from the other direction but but um you know adam silver let you know black lives matter all over the nba court a bunch of a bunch of platitudes and pontifications about moral superiority and and and, and, and you know Ethics around racial relations. And you let him slide under the radar. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And maybe most of all, black man actually becomes the president of the United States. The highest office is the commander in chief of the entire military. The, the, the military that, remember Joe Biden said, isn't just the most powerful military in the world, it's the most powerful military in the history of the world. He gets into office. He gets into office riding the wave and, and momentum of this, this celebration that a black man could actually become president in America. This, this, this moment, this milestone of reconciliation of a more dark, uh, uh, contentious racial history here in this country. He gets into office and doesn't do a motherfucking thing but perpetuate the status quo, and you let him slide under the radar. Jada Pinkett Smith, you prop up, you prop up, you put on a pedestal because she's had some celebrity or some success in Hollywood, some, some mediocre success, to, to say the least, I mean, to be quite honest. Set it off was cool, you know? She had a few movies in there. I'm not going to lie. She was all right. You know, Low Down Dirty Shame is one of the one of the all time black classics. She was good in that. You know, she 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 did all right. But you prop her up on a pedestal. When so clearly she is hell bent on destroying Will Smith. I mean, crushing him. Just I don't know. I don't know nothing about their relationship. I don't know nothing about, you know, their, their purse. I don't know about what, what really went down between them. All I know is when a woman comes to the public square, when a woman comes out on the podium, on the stage to the podium, under the spotlight, and says the things that she said about the man that she's married to, it's intended to crush him. 
because nobody would think it would do otherwise. And a lot of you black men, and Will Smith, Will Smith is the microcosm of black America. Will Smith right now is the microcosm of black America. This is exactly what black America has become writ large. A bunch of black men chasing love, chasing, chasing affection, chasing intimacy, chasing pussy. I know I'm not supposed to say that because I'm running for Senate, but they're chasing pussy and they're getting led astray. And the black woman and her white liberal ally, her white woman, her white liberal woman ally, and, and her cuck husband are all over there in the circle jerk. And you, the black man, the black man who has to work the job to put the food on the table, the black man who has to pay the credit card bills for all of the, all of the miscellaneous uh, uh, goods and, and things that the that the American, the, the American radical materialist culture has deemed necessary for the modern family, the anti-family court, the, you know, so on and so forth. You got to foot the bill. It's a microcosm of American citizenship writ large. You're not alone. You're not alone. American citizens writ large got to foot the bill for the pipe dreams of our elites. It's just that you're at the lowest. You're, you're the bottom of the totem pole. pole. Black man. In the post-World War II democratic liberal order that claimed to protect the identity of the Jewish people and then claimed to be protecting the identity of the blacks in America, you, the black man, are at the bottom of the totem pole. And it ain't because of the white man. It, it, it's, it's no longer good enough to generalize it as a black and white thing. Because there are much more sophisticated, much more specific political ideologies that inform your position on the po totem pole than skin color. Secularism, liberalism, communism, globalism. Words that you're not supposed to know, words you're not supposed to say, words that if another black man comes to you and tries to inform you on, He's just trying to sound smart or he's a conspiracy theorist or he's radical or he's an extremist or he's a domestic terrorist or he's a Christo fascist or he's a, 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 an Uncle Tom or he's a darling of the alt-right, darling of the far right. The Washington Post said I was a darling of the far right. They didn't even say the alt-right. They said the far right. Damn. I'm the problem. Me. Me telling you that your citizenship has value, or at least it should if America first leaders were elected, that you're an American citizen, what your ancestors fought for was you to be recognized underneath the Constitution as an equal citizen. You're a citizen. You have rights. You have inalien unalienable rights that were granted to you by a creator, which gives you a level of sovereignty, a level of sovereignty that no government no government, no collection of government agencies, no collection of political power, no collection of, of, of economic imperialism can ever walk on, can never, can never, can never defeat unless you allow it to. I'm your problem? Me? Me, the one who's saying that you pay $800 more for the same goods and services than you did last year? because you voted for Joe Biden, who had no plan for economic prosperity and well-being of the American people. But he picked Kamala Harris as his running mate. He's going to put some more black people in his cabinet, in his administration, make sure they're trans. Put the trans people in the administration because that's equivalent to, to helping black people. Meanwhile, his puppet pundits over there at MSNBC, or let's say the puppet pundits of, of the Democratic platform over at MSNBC, and let's not even call it the Democratic platform. Let's call it what it is, the post-World War II Democratic Liberal Order Uniparty. The puppet puppets over at MSNBC, again, you see the alliance, black woman, effeminate black men, on the fence, black men, Lester Holt, the black woman, 
Morning Mika, Cuck Joe. They tell you you shouldn't even know you you, you learned inflation from 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 white supremacists, from Republicans, from Donald Trump. You didn't know the word inflation. You didn't know what inflation was. You didn't know what an inflation was before far right wing conspiracy theorists started to talk about debt. If it wasn't for the debt hawks, you wouldn't even know what inflation was, black man. You, you don't feel the pinch in your wallet. You, you don't feel the anxiety at the end of the month when the bills are increasing. Secret, secret fees, hidden fees. Subscription services, you know, taking your price up. Terms and conditions you got to sign. No, no choice. Monopolization. The monopolization of the, the mobile and tech industry. Giving you no choice but to accept the, the unlawful, unconstitutional tax or, or, or price gouging of corporations and then tax from your government, and I'm your problem. And Jada Pinky gets an audience and a budget and, and, and support from the corporate community to have a Red Table Talk podcast or a Red Table Talk production with all of the black celebrities coming through, all of the agents. All of the marketing, all of the representatives coming through to have a conversation about a bunch of fucking nothing. Talking about the the the, the sexual identity, you know, the sexual identity crisis of of Willow and Jaden, you know, and 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 how they they eat mangoes while they take walks on the grass with with no with no shoes and socks or, or whatever the fuck else you know, Judeo-Buddhist thing they got, they got going on out there. Scientology, I don't know what the fuck they're into. Doesn't matter to me, doesn't matter. My focus is you. My focus is what your focus is, what it should be. Black man, let them focus on that. Let all the black women in the country gather around the red table talk to hear a bunch of stories about, you know, I wasn't happy enough in my relationship. I wasn't getting enough attention. My husband wasn't doing me right. He wasn't giving, I, did, I didn't feel, I, I needed to feel wanted and loved and that's why I decided to have an extramarital relationship with somebody else. Let them sit over there and talk about that shit all they want to. You, you are the captain of your own ship when it comes to your citizen, your citizenry. You are the captain when it comes to your citizenship. You are the captain when it comes to your citizenship. You are the master of your destiny. But first, you got to become the master of your own household. You know, stop putting, you, you know, you're putting, a, you're putting a pussy up on a pedestal is what you're doing, black men, respectfully. You're putting the pussy up on a pedestal is what you're doing. The domestic, the domestic politics, the domestic dynamic between the black man and the, and the black woman have gotten so out of control, so out of hand, you become a puppet to a much, much greater plan. Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030, uh, Belt and Road. I mean, these people have global plans. I mean, imagine a group of affluent, world-traveling, omnisexual, posh, political activists sitting in Davos, Switzerland, talking about global agendas on the basis of your cultural identity while you live in Detroit, Michigan, while you live in in New York City, while you live in Philadelphia, while you live in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, while you live in, in, in Milwaukee or, or Chicago or Minneapolis or Los Angeles or Houston or Dallas or St. Louis, I mean, wherever, San Diego, Phoenix, wherever it is, imagine 
that a group of intellectual political elites get together in Davos, Switzerland, and they use your cultural identity, your cultural history, your cultural circumstance to justify their agendas, and the whole world sings kumbaya to it. And when they make it home, you pay extra taxes for it. I mean, you got to be. This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. We appreciate your viewership and your listenership today and in the future. I hope you understand what I'm getting at. We're going we're gonna to start to build this conversation. I know it didn't have much to do with Jada Pinkett, but you, I, I hope you're getting where I'm going here. The country is going to be saved by, by working class black and Hispanic men, black and Latino men. A culture of which I belong to both. So I feel some duty to speak this way, you know, to my fellow men all, all across the country. Wake up. Wake up. Nobody's saying the Republican Party is perfect. In fact, we all have a huge criticism of the Republican Party. If you need evidence of that, Matt Gates, who they all want to make the enemy, is making that very case right now there in the Congress. Yeah, these Republicans are a problem. They're preservers of a corrupt status quo. Absolutely. So if you need evidence of what I'm saying, if you if you need if you need further confirmation of what I'm saying, that this movement, the nationalist populist movement, the America first movement is not about Republican politics. It's about politics for the American citizen, you, the working man. That's what it's about. You need evidence. Just look at the Congress right now and Matt Gates. Both sides have come together in unanimous unity to say Matt Gates is a problem and the other seven who ran with him, they need to be weeded out. You know, they're slowing things down. Let's get back to business as usual. We got a war to go to. We got two wars to go to, maybe three, hey, maybe four. A lot of business to be done, a lot of money to be made, a lot of people to get killed, a lot of people to be, to be annihilated. Who's holding it up? Who are these would-be dissenters? Who are these would-be uh, extremists, radicals, rebels that would hold up the business of killing war and, 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 and profit? Who are they? Who are these people that would come to the, the well of the House, the, the well of the, the United States Congress, and, and, and advocate that, that the spending of the federal government be reined in uh, as to, you know, support the interests of the American people. Who are these individuals? Bring them forth. Let them hang before sunset, right? I mean, this is what we're dealing with. So I'm not telling you Republican, Republican, Republican. The reason why I joined the Republican Party, the reason why I'm running as a Republican is because the Democrat, the, the entire Democrat apparatus is, is completely aligned with this new world order agenda from, from the top, the political elites, all the way down to the grassroots activists. The hegemony of, of, of ideology on the Democrat side is far worse than it is on the Republican side. And if there's any example, you can tell by what's going on in the Congress right now. Which side is the friction coming from? Which side is holding up the status quo? Which side is stopping business as usual? The Republican side. Yeah, because there's some people over here that don't care about party anymore. This ain't about party. This is about the people. I feel I was on the right side of history with that. I feel Donald Trump was on the right side of history with that. You see Robert F. Kennedy. You see a RFK defecting and going and going independent. Why? Why does the RFK go independent? Why does a Tulsi Gabbard go independent? Why are people switching from the Democrat Party over to the Republican Party or, or to the to, to independent? Because there's too much, there, there's too much hegemony, 
ideological hegemony on the Democrat platform. At least over here on the Republican side, there's some difference of opinion. In fact, it's split about 50-50. Now, it doesn't reflect that in the Congress. The America First or MAGA movement has not yet, has not yet represented itself in the Congress or in the Senate. But at the grassroots level, at the grassroots level, in the party, in the Republican Party, the party activists, the party officers, the party delegates in, in, in communities all around the country are about a 50-50 split. So we're making the right, we're making the right, uh, we're, we're making the right progress, for lack of a better term. We're moving in the right direction. And that's part of the desperation they feel to speed up their agendas. And you're going to see that desperation turn into chaos and violence and, and, and unabashed tyranny, a trampling, a walking all over your rights. Understand who it's coming from. Understand who it's coming from. Join the Republican Party. What better chance do you get than to represent yourself and your own interests in the political process? Join the Republican Party. Let the Republican Party know how you feel. Let the Republican Party know the error of their ways. That's a great thing. It's a good thing. We invite that. Now, some people here in the Republican Party, even in Minnesota, they may not agree with me. They may not like me. They, they may not see the world the way that I see it. But overall, you know, I've been warmly welcomed in the Republican Party. And I know you're going to say the same thing that you say about Larry Elder or any other black man that dares to venture off the Democrat plantation. I know you're going to say the same thing. They only like you over there because you're willing to, you know, you're willing to, you know, repeat the, the you know, the, the rhetoric. No, that's not true. If there's one thing you can say about this podcast, if there's one thing you can say from watching this last hour and a half, it's that I am an honest and original thinker. I have the courage, I have the audacity to think honestly before this audience and any audience I speak in front of. I'm not married to any set of ideas. I'm a Christian. I'm American. I'm a man. I have children. I believe in God, family, country, in that order. In that order. If you got a problem with that, fuck you. We appreciate your viewership and your listenership today and in the future. The fight continues. Don't die a jerk off. And as always, Godspeed.